It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. A beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood. A neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I've always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please, won't you be my neighbor? All right, just so we can clear the air, the correct answer to today's question is the day after Thanksgiving. And if you guys know me, you know that's how it is. Uh, the rest of you who've already started, um, there, this is church. There's grace for you. There's forgiveness for you. There's still love for you. Uh, you're still welcome here, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, we don't always see eye to eye, and sometimes you're wrong. And uh, you're wrong right now. So, no, it's okay. If you start listening to Christmas music, that's fine. That's who you are. Um, but, hey, it's, we're getting to that season. It's Thanksgiving season. It's Christmas season. We just wrapped up Halloween season, all that kind of stuff. But today we are wrapping up our Won't You Be My Neighbor series. And uh, we have spent, this is week eight of eight of this series. This has been a journey. Actually, this has been a, the longest series we've ever done at one church. And it's important for us because I think it's been necessary for us to go through this. Uh, because as a series is meant to be, it's meant to be a journey. It's meant to be this adventure for us to explore, to learn, to dig into together and take it step by step. And this idea of loving your neighbor as yourself, as Jesus commanded, as the church lives out, this isn't something we can wrap up in one week. It's not even something we can wrap up in eight weeks. It's a life for us to continue continue to strive to follow because what we see here is our vertical love of God is shown through our horizontal love of people around us. And to recap what we've been doing now this for, for the past seven weeks, we've said this. Week one, we looked at the story of the Good Samaritan and how Jesus taught that everybody is our neighbor. And week two, we talked about how we are neighbors to other people by investing in them, by building relationships with them. And one of the best ways to build relationships with people is to share stories of our lives and to hear the story of their lives. We talked about in week three how our, our dining room table sharing meals together is one of the most powerful tools we have as people to be neighbors to each other. So we should be inviting people to have meals with us. In week four, we talked about having tenacious friendships and doing whatever we can to introduce people to Jesus because through our friendships, we may be somebody else's miracle. That when we introduce someone to Jesus, they experience life and love and grace and forgiveness and new life through Christ. And that can be their miracle because of our friendship. In week five, we talked about how we should be like God and we should be a celebratory people. We celebrate and throw parties for people, small, big, anywhere in between. We should gather people together to celebrate. In week six, we talked about how we should cross cultures. That if our friends are just like us and think like us and look like us and talk like us, we're doing it wrong. We should have friendships and relationships with people who are different and we cross into different cultures. And then last week we talked about something we all struggle with, and that's busyness. And how our schedules can be the thing that gets in the way of us following Jesus and, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. And so we've been talking about strategic things and, and, and different topical things about how to love our neighbors as ourselves as we are following Jesus. And then here's the thing as we're wrapping up today. A series at one church, really any church, it's never meant to be a series where we just listen to it. Like this whole journey we've been going on of won't you be my neighbor, it's not something that's just meant to just be listened to and go, oh, that makes sense, and then just leave it at that. This is always meant for us to be challenged, to be encouraged, and to take faithful steps to live out what we are talking through 
in Scripture. Because oftentimes when Jesus would, would give a teaching or a challenge to somebody, he would always finish it by saying, go and do likewise. Go and do. Go and do this as well. Because Jesus didn't teach people for knowledge. He taught for life change. He was about permanent and tangible shifts in people's lifestyle. So when someone says they put their faith in Jesus, it has to lead to transformation and life change. So when Jesus says to love our neighbors as ourselves, then we, if we're following Jesus, have to love our neighbors as ourselves ourselves. Because being a neighbor and loving your neighbor is living differently. We've had this Mr. Rogers vibe and theme throughout this because he's the greatest neighbor our city's ever seen, but he's a neighbor we could strive to be like and want to be like because he's loving and, and, and forgiving. And he loved people because of the image of God put into all of them. He was a faithful follower of Jesus. And one of the ways that Mr. Rogers lived differently in his life was actually with one of the reoccurring characters on his show, and that was Officer Clemens. If you guys remember Officer Clemens, you ever watched that show? Uh, basically, who, here's who they were. They could not be more different people in real life. Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, a white conservative ordained minister, and Francois Clemens was a, a black man, an openly gay man, who played a police officer in a, culture, a time and culture where police officers were not viewed in a very positive light. And so Mr. Rogers invites Francois Clemens to be on this show to be in a recurring role in this. And they had this famous scene that they actually did multiple times. And the scene was in the front yard of Mr. Rogers' house and there was a little kiddie pool. Um, you guys remember growing up with those, the little plastic ones where you put the water and the water's like 30 degrees, it's freezing, but kids love it. Uh, Mr. Rogers had this pool filled up and Officer Clemens would come by and uh, Mr. Rogers would come, hey, I'm just cooling down my feet. Like, here he is right here. And what happened in this scene was this, is Mr. Rogers invited Officer Clemens, Francois Clemens, to share in his little kiddie pool to cool his feet on a hot summer day. But what, said, what was said in that time, in that culture, is this was a time where the black community was being kicked out of local community pools because they weren't invited to swim with people uh, of different ethnicities. And so Mr. Rogers, who loved Jesus and loved people, he set this example and said, uh-uh, Officer Clemens, you can share my pool. You can share my space. You can share my life with me. And he lived differently. And what was even more amazing is Francois Clemens said yes to this. If you ever watched the Mr. Rogers documentary, it's amazing. You should. You, you see a side of Mr. Rogers you didn't even know existed. He's funny. Uh, all this type of stuff. But Francois Clemens was on there interviewed uh, a lot throughout this documentary. And it was amazing to hear how they interacted together. Because oftentimes we can look at this and go, oh man, look at Mr. Rogers being the hero of this story. But the truth is, the hero of this story is both Mr. Rogers and Officer Clemens. Because together, they showed on TV what it looks like to love each other as neighbors. They were neighbors to each other. And it's one thing for us to say we love God with all of our hearts, our minds, soul, and strength. But it's only true if our lives reflect that. And our lives will reflect it if we love those around us. And as we wrap up this series, we need to do it in a way that reminds us that it goes beyond what we think and believe and say. Love of God is shown by what we do. Being a neighbor is something we do because when it comes to following Jesus, what we do is far more important than what we say. Early in his uh, ministry, Jesus declared a sort of like mission statement uh, for what he was all about, what he was about to do in his public ministry. And in Luke 4, 18 through 21, we see this. And the setting is this. Jesus is going to the temple to worship like he routinely did. He was a faithful Jew and always went to the temple to worship, to pray, to read scripture. And he had one of the, uh, one of the, the, the temple workers to bring him the scripture uh, that said this. It says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of the sight for, for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And so Jesus is at the temple, and this is like early in his ministry, and he has the attendant bring this scroll from Isaiah, and he declares this. He said, this is what I'm all about, uh, that I am here because the Spirit of God is on me to proclaim good news to the poor, to set the captives free, to bring healing to the broken, to bring good news to all of those around me. And he tells them as they're looking, this is true. 
This is what I'm here for. And what's interesting is he didn't focus on, he didn't pick scripture that says that focused on individual sin problems or changing a person's belief. He didn't even mention dying on the cross. That that's what he was going to be doing at any point soon. Now, those things are still a very big deal to Jesus' ministry. Sin was and is a big deal. Jesus did change people's beliefs about God, life, and faith. And he did come to die for forgiveness of sins and rescue and restoration of the world. But in this pseudo mission statement that Jesus Jesus declares early in his ministry, he declared something much bigger than the individual. He declared the kingdom of God coming. And then it was here. He declared that the kingdom of rescue and restoration was here. He came to restore people and the world back to its original goodness. And everything he, he listed was action-oriented with everything he read from that scripture in Isaiah. It was about loving the people around him. And those who would follow Jesus would be expected to live in the same exact way. So Jesus declares this kind of mission statement. And then he just goes and just unleashes this whole ministry of love and reconciliation, forgiveness through God, through him, on the world around him. In fact, in Matthew 25, shortly before Jesus' death, he, said, he tells three different parables, three different stories that talk about this kingdom that he brought to this world. In Matthew 25, he, he talks about how it's meant to be something we live out. And he says this right before his death. The first one he tells in Matthew 25 is the story of the ten bridesmaids waiting for the groom. They were waiting for, until the groom's arrival, and the bridesmaid's job in the situation in that culture was to declare that the groom and his men were there to retrieve the bride and go, and the wedding fest, feast would take place, and all those things. And so these ten bridesmaids, they were supposed to be on Look out. But the problem was only five of them brought extra oil for their lamps because they didn't know when the groom would show up. It could, you know, there'd be traveling problems, that something would get in the way, whatever it may be. So the groom and his men could show up in the middle of the night, but the bridesmaid's jobs was to be ready for this coming groom. But some of them only brought a certain amount of oil for their lamps because though if he came at night, they wouldn't have enough to get through the evening. And so this happens and basically Jesus is telling them, you have to be ready for this coming groom. And what he was saying is you had to be ready for, Jesus, for God's Messiah, which is him. And oftentimes when you're ready, basically what he was saying is you were not living your life in a way that was prepared for the work that God called you to do. You were focused on other things. So he says that parable. Then he tells the story of the three servants. And, the, and what, what basically this story says that there's a master who's about to go on a trip. He's going to be away for a while. And he calls three servants to him. And he gives them all talents. And a talent, each talent is worth just over $1,000 each. So it's a pretty good chunk of money. And he gives one of his servants five talents. He gives one of another servants two talents. And he gives another servant one talent, each according to their abilities. And he tells them to go and take care of this. This is his money that he's entrusting them with. Uh, he is trusting his servants with his stuff, his resources. And so the master comes back from his trip and he starts talking to his servants to kind of settle the accounts. And the one who had five talents brings him back his five plus five more. And the master is excited. He says, come celebrate with me. You took what I gave you and you didn't just do anything with it. You actually made more money for me. This is great. You've taken my resources and cared for them greatly. The one who gave two talents for, he came back and said, hey, here's the two talents you gave me and here's two more on top of that. And again, the master's just as excited. He wasn't excited because the guy with five made more because he made five more. He's just as excited for the, second, the one with two talents because he took care of his resources. But then he calls the one who had one talent and the guy said, hey, listen, I know you're a hard man. Uh, he basically says he's scared of him. He says, listen, what I did is I actually went and buried the money in the ground because I didn't want to lose it. And the master's like, what are you doing? You could have at least put it in, on, uh, in the bank account and made interest off it and made something off of that. Instead, you just do this and waste this time and energy and resources I've given you. You've done nothing with this. And he actually took the talent away from him and gave it to the guy who, had, who brought him 10 talents total back. And basically what he's telling them is you've wasted this opportunity. The truth is the guy with one talent wasn't uh, scared of his master. He thought his master wasn't coming back. And so he was just saving the, thousand dollar, the, the, the one talent, the thousand plus dollars, whatever it was worth for himself, because he wanted to take the resources and use it in his own way. And the master knew that. And basically what he's teaching in these stories, Jesus is saying, listen, what you have, the stuff you, you're given, you are expected to do something with, to honor God with it. What we do with what we have matters, Jesus says. So time, resources, the relationships we have, what we do with those things matters. And then he tells this last story in Matthew 25. And it's the story of the sheep and goats. And he says this in Matthew 25, 31 through 33. 
When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people uh, one from another as, shepherd, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And basically this is something that would have been really common to see because uh, in the fields going around, there would be shepherds and flocks of sheep and goats everywhere. And oftentimes at night, they would put all of them together for safety in the pen. But then the next morning they would separate out the sheep would go one way, the goats would go to the other, mainly because sheep had a lot of value compared to the goats because their wool was worth money. Uh, it brought warmth, it helped make clothing. The goats kind of were just there. They didn't have a lot of value in that situation. And so basically, as Jesus was saying, like, it's going to happen is at the end, there will be judgment. And it will be like a separation from the sheep, from the goats. There's some who are worthy in what they were doing, and other ones are kind of just there. And this is the setting he sets in something that would very been very familiar to the people uh, listening to him teaching. He will separate them out. And it sounds kind of intense, this idea of judgment happening and God separating the good from the bad, the useful from the unuseful. Uh, it almost sounds mean, almost sounds unloving, but the truth is God is just and God is still loving and gracious in that. But what's interesting, we have to look at this and go, okay, how does God separate the sheep from the goat? And this is what Jesus explains. And this is uh, verses 34 through 46. This is longer, so follow with me. Read it on the screen. If you have your phones and the app up, you can follow with that too. But Matthew 25, 34 through 46, this is how Jesus says God will, uh, will separate the sheep from the goats. It says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and, and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothing or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. And Jesus tells this story and he says, listen, it is based on what they did. When they fed, gave water, they clothed, they cared for the sick, they visited in prison, they did that for Jesus. But when they didn't, they ignored Jesus. And how does this any, make any sense as Jesus is explaining it? Because here's the truth. Every single person bears something in common and that's every single person bears the image of God. Every single person is created in the image of God, no matter their background, their baggage, their beliefs, or their behaviors. And when they are in need or they are lonely, when we pass up opportunities to love them as we love ourselves, to love them as God loves them, we miss the opportunity to do that for Christ. And Jesus lays this very clearly that every person has the image of God in them. And what's even more amazing in this is Jesus isn't even just talking about every single person. He's specifically talking about the church in this situation. Because one of the worst people churches treat are actually people in their church. It's almost like how we treat our family worse than we do strangers sometimes because we just, there's more forgiveness there, more grace there. But Jesus is saying, listen, the way you treat those around you, the way you treat the least of these, the way you treat those who are hungry, the way you treat those who are lonely, the way you treat your neighbors is how you treat me. That is a huge, huge thing to recognize in this teaching. How we treat each other is how we treat Jesus. What we do and what we don't do matters in the kingdom of God. It's not about having all the right theological topics figured out, but it's about living differently. We could argue all day about what different scriptures mean and what different theological points are, things like that. But if we are not loving our neighbors as ourselves, the whole thing is wasted. Wasted. With, we have to live in a way that is different. We have to live in ways that, that are the values of God's kingdom. It's about loving God and loving your neighbor. And more than anything, our actions will show ourselves and others where our hearts truly lie. You see, oftentimes in the church, we talk about sin. 
And we should because it's a very real thing. But often we talk about sins of commission. And what that is, these are sins, or these are things that we did wrong. So we lied, we cheated, we lusted, we, we lost our temper and, and hurt those around us. These are sins of commission. These are things that we all do. And I think a lot of us, if not all of us, will look at these things and go, yeah, that was wrong. That was sin. That was messed up. That was broken. This reflects the broken nature inside of me. We're all guilty of that. And these are serious things. But equally as serious are sins of omission. And these are the sins of the things that we don't do. And maybe this is even more serious. It's the stuff that we don't do. And Matthew 25 is all about sin of omission, things that we don't do, not living differently in light of Jesus and God's kingdom. Pastor Mark Batterson, who's actually the pastor of a church in D.C. that gave us all this series information. So the graphics, the, uh, the resources that we've had for this, this church gave us this stuff for free because they're awesome and loving, and we're a small little church plant. Uh, but Ma Mark Batterson says this about this topic. He says, we can do nothing wrong and still do nothing right. I mean, think about that for a second. We can do nothing wrong in our lives, but we can still do nothing right. And so life following Jesus and in God's kingdom has to lead to living life differently. And that means loving your neighbors in a radical way. This was the kingdom that Jesus ushered in. This is how the early church lived because they followed this teaching. They followed this call. They followed this challenge. They cared for the poor and they cared for each other. They did radical things in that culture that was blowing that culture's mind. Because in that culture, for instance, if a baby was born with a defect or if a baby was born and it was a female over a male, it was viewed as less than in that culture. So what they would do is they would go leave the babies on the mountainside to die of exposure. But the early church, they would sneak out. They would go rescue those babies. They would essentially have adopt those babies, raise them as their own because they had value for who they were. They, were. they were born in the image of God. And the church would do these things. They would take care of the poor, the widows, and the orphans. And they didn't have everything figured out. The church was a theological mess early on. Hence the whole point of the New Testament. All of Paul's letters was often instructing them and, and, re, and correcting them on some of their theological understanding of who God was and how the church was supposed to operate. They didn't have everything figured out theologically about God or how they were supposed to live, but they did have it figured out they were supposed to love God and love their neighbors. And this actually drew the attention of the Roman Empire. The way they lived made the Roman Empire take notice the most powerful force in the world at that point. And they didn't make the Roman Empire notice them because of their beliefs. In fact, the Roman Empire scoffed at Christians because of their beliefs. Because the Christians believed in one God. And the Roman Empire looked at Christians in that culture like, these idiots only believe in one God. They're essentially godless because the Roman Empire and the Romans, they believed, uh, they had a polytheistic culture. They believed in tons of different gods, the God of war, the God of the sun, the God of fertility, the God of all these different things. And so the Christians who were proclaiming there was only one God, the Roman Empire were like, these idiots have no idea what they're talking about. They're essentially atheists to them. Like they just, they scoffed them, they mocked them. But what they noticed was how they lived. They noticed how they cared for each other. They noticed how they cared for even their own people in the Roman Empire. And Emperor Julian eventually said this after seeing the Christians and how they responded. He says this, It is a scandal that the godless Galileans care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. While those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render them, let us not permit others to excel us in good deeds. The Roman Empire, all the power, all the resources, all the wealth, they looked at the Christians and said they are blowing us out of the water with how they are caring for the poor. Let's not let them do that. It was kind of like a challenge, which is kind of funny to me. But the Christians just didn't stop. This is who they were. They were going to love their neighbors as themselves because this is what God called them to do. And the Roman Empire hated that someone was better than them at doing something. And this little ragtag bunch of people transformed by Jesus was making the Roman Empire look weak and bad at caring for those in need. And the thing is, the church wasn't this crazy, wealthy church in this situation, but they were crazy in love with God. And they led them to do crazy things with loving their neighbors as themselves. Imagine if our government and our communities and our schools and our neighborhoods today saw the church the same way. And said, wow, how are they 
outdoing us in caring for the poor and taking care of those in need and loving their neighbors. And this is what Jesus calls us to do, to live differently, so differently that others will take notice. And as we wrap up this series, this is what we need to take away from it, that a follower of Jesus lives differently. A follower of Jesus lives life in a way that radically loves God by loving those around him. And we can't just say Jesus is Lord and not love our neighbors. We say Jesus is Lord by loving our neighbors. And so how do we live differently? I think the first thing we have to pay attention to is truly give our lives to Christ. I think one of the biggest holdups for us living differently is that we haven't really surrendered our lives to Jesus. We believe in Jesus as Savior, but not always as Lord. And we can't miss this. We love the idea of Jesus as Savior, the one who rescues us, the one who redeems us, the one who forgives us. We all need that. We all long for that in our lives. We love the idea of Jesus as Savior. But the idea of Jesus as Lord is a whole different level there. Because we are saying then, if Jesus is Lord, then he's in charge. That he's the Lord. He's the one who sits on the throne of our lives. That everything filters through him. And that means we have to take ourselves off the throne of our lives. So when we say Jesus is Lord, that means we give him the power. And that's where you reply to Jesus, because you say so, Jesus, I will. I will. And this may be where some of you need to kind of address. Where maybe you've said, yeah, Jesus is good. Jesus is God. I believe in him. He's my Savior. But is Jesus Lord? Is Jesus Lord? And if that's a decision you need to make, I encourage you to make that decision. I encourage you to talk to me or one of our other leaders here at the church so we can uh, pray with you to walk you into that, that decision and things like that because this is a big deal. There is always a decision that has to be made. We can like Jesus. We can like him from a distance. We can like him up close here at church. But there has to be a decision. Do I make Jesus not just my Savior? Do I make him my Lord? Do we truly give our lives to him? On top of that, after we give our lives to Christ and make sure we do, we have to recognize the importance of presence. When it comes to loving God ourselves and loving our neighbors, we have to recognize that being present with people is one of the most powerful things we have. We have to be there with people and for people and not just empty words that I want to be there for my neighbors and I long to do good things for the people around me. It has to be this real thing. We have to be fully present. I think one of the greatest examples we see of being present is Jesus. In fact, when Jesus is one of his close friends, Lazarus, dies, he goes fully knowing he's about to resurrect Lazarus from the dead. Like, he's about to show off his God power, raise Lazarus from the dead. In fact, his sister um, was actually nervous about it because he's like, hey, open the, you know, open the tomb. She's like, no, Jesus, he stinks at this point. And actually, the King James Version is really funny because it says he stinketh, like, which is awesome. Like your, your kids or someone comes to you like, hey, you stinketh. Um, but Jesus knew what he was about to do. But before he even got there, he wept. Because Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, were upset. They were mourning. And so Jesus was present with them because he understood the impact of death. He understood the pain they were going through. So he was present with them. Before he was about to raise their brother, he actually wept. Like he could have just said, guys, chill out. Look, dude, there's Lazarus right there. But he wept with them. He was present with them. We have to be present with the people around us. We've had these neighbor maps throughout this series. And we've encouraged everyone to fill them out and then to put the names of your neighbors, to, to pray for them, to engage them, to learn more about them. And here's my encouragement. As we wrap up this series, don't get rid of this neighbor map. Put it somewhere where you'll see it every day. Put it somewhere where it will remind you to pray for your neighbors, to engage your neighbors, to build relationships with them. Do what it looks like to be present in their lives. Make this a lifestyle that we are living. And if you haven't grabbed one, if you're newer, go grab one. We still have them on our information tables. Grab it, put names of your neighbors on it, uh, and look to be present with them. Look to love your neighbors as yourself. These things can be powerful for us because presence will lead to permission. Permission to share stories and share our hearts with others, the, the permission to hear their stories, permission to share meals with other people, permission to introduce people to Jesus. We shared this last week, but 80% of people are open to going to a church if they are invited by a friend. When we are present with people, we have permission to go into their lives to invite them to life transformation. We have permission to help make change. To be present means that we give them our time. I mean, this is not just a series for us to hear. It's a series for us to live out. So we have to give our lives to Christ. We have to be present, but we also have to take action. 
It's not about our thoughts or good intentions, but by our actions. Our lives must be fueled to action out of love of God and our neighbors. We must take action to build relationships, to make time for them, to invite people over for meals, to asking about their stories and their lives, to sharing our faith with them and inviting them to church with us. That when there is a need in their lives, we step and we meet that need. We do whatever it means to be a neighbor to those around us. We love those. We take action into that. When there is a need, we meet that need. This is one of the reasons why we're doing the Amen to Action meal packing the day after Thanksgiving. When everyone's gonna be shopping, and maybe you'll go shopping before that because you get up at like 3 a.m. and you're crazy like that, that's fine. But from 9 to 1230 that day, we are meeting at the convention center with over 3,000 other volunteers of people from different churches, different backgrounds, different theological backgrounds. Because what's beautiful about this morning that we're gonna do is we are not going to agree on everything about God and about people and about faith uh, with everybody in that room. But you know what we will be doing and agreeing on? Loving our city together. By packing over a million meals that morning for all the food banks around our city to help care for people in this time. And so I'm going to invite you guys again to be a part of this. If you're around, take time to come join us. We're, we're looking for a table of 20. And that table of 20 from one church will pack 7,500 meals our, ourselves that morning. And there's uh, the sign-up sheet out in the lobby. I invite you guys to come be a part of this with us. We're entering into this holiday season where there are needs, there is brokenness, there is depression, there is hurt because the holidays can bring a lot of different things for people. And we have an opportunity right now, one church, to be neighbors, not in just this season, but every season moving forward. But think about those around you. Think about those at work. Think about those in your schools. Think about those in your neighborhood. What does it look like to be present with them and to take action with them this season? What does it look like to make sure that they felt like they were made sure they were invited to the holidays with you if they don't have somewhere else to go or to come to church with you if they don't have a church to go to or just to come over for a meal in between the holidays. What's it look like to take action? Because this is who Jesus was. Jesus wasn't someone with empty words or empty intentions. It was out of love for you that he gave his life. For your sin, for your life, because he loves you, he gave himself over for forgiveness, for rescue, for redemption for all of us. And wouldn't it be something if, you know, Jesus comes to earth, God sends Christ, and he comes down and says, hey, God loves you. You know, I hope everything goes well for you, but good luck, everybody. That's not how Jesus operated. Jesus was the greatest neighbor of them all. By being God, he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. He came and he humbled himself, as Philippians 2 says, to take on the nature of a servant. And he even humbled himself to the point of taking on the cross. The most brutal, the most vile, the most disgusting way a human being was ever killed. It was a mockery. It was for humility. And Jesus took on that sacrifice for us. Because Jesus loves you so much that he couldn't bear the idea of not giving you an opportunity to be with him. So he gave his life to make that happen. And here's what's crazy. Jesus loves your neighbors just as much as he loves you. And sometimes you're the one to show them that. So we have to live differently. We have to live in a way that if we follow Jesus, we have our faith in Jesus, we live in a way that shows people we follow Jesus. That means we love them. So what are you going to do to live differently? Here's a couple of questions I want to challenge all of us to think through today and going into this week and to implement. The first is this. What are two to three things that you'll do differently moving forward? What are two to three things that you will do differently? One of the things I, I, I'm kind of going to challenge myself with is this. It's getting colder outside. And so sometimes at the bus stop for Noah, people just drive up in their cars. And I live like, a one-minute walk from Manoa's bus stop. And sometimes, yes, I drive my car up there. But there's also people who don't have vehicles or they don't bring their vehicles and they're just sitting outside waiting for the kids to come on and go off the bus. So for me, this season, I'm going to challenge myself. And it's my responsibility to get Noah from the bus stop, I need to walk. I need to be present with my neighbors. If it means a five-minute conversation with them, then so be it. If it means I'm freezing because they don't want to talk to me, then I'll so be it, but I need to be present with them. That's part of it. And someone in our small group this week challenged us and 
challenge me without knowing it that one of the things that I get kind of busy with is my phone. That takes away my attention from people, that takes away my presence with people. And so I'm going to be as cognizant as I possibly can to put the phone down and be present with those around me. Especially this season where I'll be with other people, with holidays and things of that nature. What's it going to be? There was someone in our small group this week, how we were, we were talking about and kind of lamenting the fact that we all live by neighbors. And you know, maybe you guys have those neighbors that you live by them for years, but you've never talked to them. But besides the hey, maybe, if that. And there's someone in our small group who said, you know what, there's some neighbors that we've never talked to after living in our place for years. And one of the, one of the ones in the small group said, okay, by the next week, we're going to talk to these neighbors. And I was sitting there going, yeah, that's encouraging and challenging. And I'm like, oh, I should probably do the same thing. So what are we going to do differently? What are two to three things that you and your family will do differently moving forward? And then here's this. Who's going to keep you accountable with this? This is a big deal. Remember we've said this, together is better. Working as one to help people follow Jesus. One of the ways we do that well is we give people permission in our lives to challenge us on this, to hold us accountable for us. Who's the person that's going to say, hey, Brandon, how are you doing with your phone? Hey, Brandon, are you talking to your neighbors at the bus stop? Hey, Brandon, are you talking to your neighbors and being present with them? Who are those people for you? Who's going to help keep you accountable? And then this, how are you and your family going to create space in your calendar? Because oftentimes we're so busy, we talked about this last week, have this conversation. Hey, how can we create space to be present with our neighbors? Inviting them over for dinner, being present in their lives, whatever that may be. How can you create space? And then this one, this is always the toughest, I think. How are you going to be vulnerable to build relationships with others? If people feel like you're not being real, they're not going to be real with you. So what are you going to do to break down those walls by being vulnerable with them? Now, just be clear, you don't go up and introduce yourself and give them your life story. That's terrifying. But in those moments as you're investing in building relationships, what's it look like to be vulnerable with them? To say, yeah, I, this is my life. These are what I'm, you know, things that go well. Here's what I'm struggling with. You know, when they ask you how you're doing, you don't just go, I'm fine. You know, no, this is how life is. What are you going to do to be vulnerable? Because the one thing we need to walk away with is this. The people, you, people need you to show them you follow Jesus more than they need you to say you do. Remember this. They need, you to show you, you, they need you to show them you follow Jesus more than they need you to say you do. So let's live differently. There's a reason we started the fall series with this because here's where we're at as a church. The first year, year plus of us as a church, we were becoming a church. We were a bunch of strangers who didn't know each other. You guys came because a postcard or someone invited you and it's figuring, you know, do I like this church? Do I connect with people? All that kind of stuff. And we've done a good job. We've become a church. But here's the problem, we have to be, be the church too. And so there was, uh, there was strategy and there was, you know, we've been praying about this, why we're starting this fall season with this, a season when we're kicking off in the school and the holidays. We started this series because we need to go be a church now. So let's go live differently and do that. Jesus, before the cross, he told those stories in Matthew 25, days before he would get arrested and crucified. And before he was arrested, he went to the garden to pray because his, his death was just it was impending, it was coming. And he prayed a bunch of different things, but he prayed in John 17, 20. He prayed for all future believers. So he prayed for us. And he prayed for us to be one, to be united in who we are, what we're all about. And that was going to be our witness to the world that Jesus was real. In fact, that's where we got our name from as a church was John 17, 20, for us to be one. And Francis Schaeffer, who was an old theologian, he said this, that John 17, 20 was the last apologetic. And what an apologetic is, it's an argument, it's, it's something that helps prove God or Jesus' existence and his teachings. And what he said is John 17, 20, one of the last teachings of Jesus, his last prayer that was rec recorded, this was the last apologetic, that in our unity and in our actionable faith together, it'll prove to the world that Jesus exists. So let's do that. Because after that prayer, Jesus was arrested. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was scorned. And he was put to death for us. And each week we remember that. We worship that. We celebrate that together through communion. And what's going to happen is today we're going to give some time to reflect on who Jesus is and what he's done and what he's called us to do right before we take communion. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to pass out communion. Then I'm going to encourage you to take a couple minutes to reflect in your seats. And my encouragement to you is this. Reflect on the cross. Reflect on the fact that we don't have a Savior who was distant and just said, had good words and good intentions, that he had action to be present with us on earth and to give his life over for us. And ask God, 
God, because you love me so much, what are some things that I can love others the way you loved me? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today and this church and these people. God, thank you for your son. And God, help us to remember that what we do and what we don't do matters in our lives, God. The things we do, the things we, we, we share, the way we live our lives, God, people see that, people watch that, and God, they need us to show them that we follow you. So God, help us to do that. Help us not to have a life of empty words and empty actions, but a life that is loving you so much that we radically love our neighbors that people take notice of that. God, transform us to be more like you. It's your name we pray. Amen.